The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss coping with depression, anxiety, and a brain tumor. My name is Andrea Garces, Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I am delighted to introduce you to our speaker today, Mary Kay Hughes, CNSRN. Mary Kay Hughes earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from Texas Women's University and is certified in thanatology. She is on clinical faculty at Texas Women's Houston, Texas Women's University Houston Center, and has been a clinical nurse specialist in the psychiatry department at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center since 1990. She, lecture, she lectures internationally and nationally about quality of life issues of cancer patients and has published on these subjects. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Hughes. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much. I was very honored when I was invited to present this webinar. Uh, I've presented this several times at the Brain Tumor Association uh, conference for patients, and now I'm so glad I can present it to even more people. So this is a big, uh, a big topic, depression, anxiety, and a brain tumor. So why do we even want to talk about this? Well, if somebody has depression or anxiety, it may increase their time in the hospital, and of course that will increase the cost. It may cause treatment delays. It also, if someone is very depressed or anxious, may, may not be adherent to the treatment plan. And of course, the caretakers are more stressed when their loved one is dealing with depression or anxiety. And some studies show that it may even affect the course of the disease. And of course, there will be poor quality of life. For anyone who's depressed or anxious, it does affect their quality of life. So when we intervene and we treat the depression or anxiety, it reduces it, hopefully. It helps the person improve their coping mechanism, and then more people want to be around them to help them, and also then they can ask for more help. So what is depression? Everybody experiences depression. It's a common everyday experience in life, or it can be a psychological reaction to stress our loss in life. That's grief. And I think that everybody I see, and everybody I see has cancer, is grieving. The first thing you grieve for is your health. And then depending on how the disease or the treatment affects you, you grieve for losses as a result of that. Also, depression is a neuropsychiatric disorder with characteristic psychological and physical symptoms. Almost every day for three weeks, this is not just for one day you wake up and you just feel terrible and it's a bad day. This is something that continues for at least two weeks. You feel depressed. You feel sad. You feel empty. Maybe you don't want to sleep. You can't sleep. Or all you want to do is sleep. Often for people with depression, they wake up around 3 a.m., they're not having pain, they don't have to go to the bathroom, they just wake up. This is a classic symptom of depression. There's hopelessness. When I ask people, what do you look forward to? What are you hoping for? People that are depressed don't have any hope. They feel hopeless about things. They may think about suicide, that they might feel that their family would be better off if they were dead. That's not the same thing as suicide is thinking about actively doing something to end your life. Because often people think they are what they do. If they can't work, if they can't do the chores that they're used to doing, they may feel worthless. They may feel guilt because they brought cancer into the family. And they don't enjoy things. It doesn't matter what they, maybe they used to enjoy reading or used to enjoy gardening and now they don't enjoy anything. Often people tell me they just go through the motions of life. They, uh, depression is not just being slow 
but it also can be agitated. There's an agitated depression where it's hard to sit still uh, and you move around a lot. Fatigue may also go with depression, loss of energy. Disinterest in sexual activity. Often this may take a person to the doctor because they don't know why they're not interested in sex. And when they go to the doctor, the doctor does a workup and finds out they have depression. And that's why they're not interested in sexual activity, because they're not interested in any activity. There may be a change in appetite. Often men quit eating. Women will maybe eat more because that comforts them. They eat more comfort food. Maybe it's hard to think or concentrate. And it's hard to make a decision. And of all times when you're dealing with cancer, that's the time when you need to be able to make a decision. Now, some of these may sound like side effects of your treatment. Often people feel fatigued. They're not hungry. They're not sleeping well, which can be side effects of the treatment. But they also can be depression if a person's feeling hopeless and not interested in anything. So how do you treat depression? Antidepressants work very well, but antidepressants take about three weeks to start working. And there's no one certain antidepressant for everybody. It's a matter of uh, trial and error. There may be an antidepressant that works very well for you, but for somebody else, that antidepressant doesn't work very well. Often the antidepressants are started at a low dose because then there are less side effects and uh, sometimes all it takes is a very low dose of antidepressant to work. Then if it doesn't work, then the doctor will keep increasing it until they get to the maximum dose before they decide to try a different antidepressant. Sometimes if there are side effects that a person can't tolerate, the antidepressant will also be changed. Uh, prescription stimulants like ProVigil or NuVigil or Ritalin, that can also help with depression. Steroids can also help. Non-prescriptive therapies can also help with depression. Sometimes people find it helpful to, if they can distract, to focus on something else, to focus on helping other people, and sometimes that can help with depression. Now, what about fears? You remember when you were first diagnosed with a brain tumor, and one of the very first thing you probably thought is, oh, no, I'm going to die. That's a huge fear that you're going to die. Or when you're feeling bad, you have fear that you'll never get better. Or, and I know with brain tumors, sometimes you're on treatment for a very, very long time. You feel like the treatment's never going to end. Or if you're having side effects from the disease or the uh, treatment, you're afraid that you're always going to feel sick. And sometimes people tell me they're afraid that they're going to be abandoned. And unfortunately, men abandon women with uh, cancer more than women abandon men. So they're afraid if they can't do what they used to do, that their family is going to leave them. They're not going to come and help them. Also, a big fear that most people have, men and women, is that they're going to be a burden, a physical burden and a financial burden. They're especially afraid if what happens if they run out of money, how can they get treatment? Some people are able to continue working with cancer, so they have a fear, what's going to happen when I can't work anymore because then I'll lose my insurance. Also a fear about how their appearance is going to change. And as you know, with certain medications, especially steroids, your appearance changes. Uh, after you've had surgery, depending on what was done, you may notice that you have temporary, uh, uh, you lose your hair with treatment or with uh, radiation. So people are afraid that their appearance is going to change. It will never get any better. So what is fear? We're always talking about fear. What is fear? It's an instinctive emotion. It's to be afraid of some expected Ill, evil. To suspect or to doubt. 
Also, it can be an unpleasant agitation or a perception of danger. Most people don't like to be walking in the dark at night in, in the city because they fear that there's danger. Also, when people are afraid, they want to hide or escape. Lerner said that fear is an uninvited guest. No one chooses to be afraid. It just is a feeling. So think about what your biggest fear is. Maybe your fear has changed since you've been diagnosed with a brain tumor. Some people tell me their biggest fear is the treatment will stop working. Others say their biggest fear is that the cancer will come back. For some people, their biggest fear is they won't live to see maybe a child graduate or somebody's wedding or somebody's retirement. So everybody has different fears. And think about what yours is. Sometimes people tell you, don't think about your fears. But sometimes by thinking about what your fear is, then you realize that's very unlikely to happen. And that can help you deal with that fear. Henry Ford said one of the greatest discoveries a man makes, one of his great surprises, is to find he can do what he was afraid he could not do. I'm sure if you all look back to before you were diagnosed with a brain tumor, you never imagined that you'd be able to go through what you've gone through. Some of you are getting just starting your treatment. Some of you are ending your treatment. Some of you are survivors. It's been a while since you've been in treatment. But when you look back, you think, how did I ever do that? But you found out you could do more than you thought, that you were much more resilient than you thought you were. So what does fear do? It protects you permanently. Because you know the fire can burn, you wouldn't put your hand in fire. You wouldn't go try to walk through a fire. So that protects you permanently because you're afraid of fire. But also, fear can protect you, and you can until you can deal with the reality of the situation. For instance, when you were diagnosed and they told you you had a brain tumor, that fear, all you could think about was, "I have a brain tumor," and it was so overwhelming it might have been very difficult for you to deal with the real, reality of the situation. So. Sometimes the doctor will tell you all the different treatments they can give you. You might not have heard that because you were still trying to deal with the fact that you had a brain tumor. So that's what fear did. It, tried, it protected you until you were emotionally ready to deal with that situation. Also, fear can paralyze you. Now, this is difficult because if you're paralyzed with fear, you're not able to get out of harm's way. And hopefully you've never been that fearful where you couldn't move. Uh, and you, you see it in movies and on the television when somebody's so afraid and you're saying run and the person can't run or move because they're paralyzed with fear. Also what fear does, it heightens the imagination. You're thinking about what if. Well, what if this happens or what if this doesn't work and what if this happens? That's because of fear your imagination is heightened. So what does it look like? How do you know when somebody's afraid? <clears throat> For some people, they get very anxious. They may get irritable. They may get angry. Other people, when they're afraid, they feel very sad. They may feel depressed. Fear takes a lot of energy. So it's going to make you feel tired, fatigued. Some people get physically ill from fear. I saw a couple the other day. And he's going to go through big surgery. But in, during the session when I was seeing them, she started vomiting because she was so fearful. She wasn't sick. She said that's what she does. When she gets fearful, she starts vomiting. Some people, when they get fearful, they distance. They pull away from people because they want to be alone. Then there's other people who are clingy. They don't want to be alone. They always want to be with somebody because they're afraid. Crying can also be because of fear. So your body can change with fear. 
because of fear you might not be able to sleep because you're sit lying there worrying about things. You may notice your heart's beating really fast. You may notice you have muscle tension in your shoulders. Some people get headaches because they have a lot of muscle tension and it causes them to have headaches from fear. Other people have shoulder pain. There's some people, like the lady I was describing, that has GI symptoms. She was throwing up. Other people may have diarrhea when they get afraid. H.P. Lovecraft said, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. When you think about it, you're not afraid of what you know. You're afraid of what you don't know because you have no idea what it's going to be, how it's going to affect you. And when you start thinking about what if, well, what if this happens or what if that happens, those things have not happened. That's not the present, is it? It's the unknown future. So when do people become more fearful? When you have a suspicious symptom. Before you had a brain tumor, if you had a headache, it wasn't a big deal. After your brain tumor, when you get a headache, often you're afraid, oh no, does that mean the brain tumor is growing? Before you had a brain tumor, occasionally you might stumble, and it was no big deal. But afterwards, if you stumble, you're thinking, oh no, maybe that's back. When you're waiting for a workup, you've had an MRI, and, and it's time for your MRI, that's hard. Because after your brain tumor is treated, you know you continue to have periodic MRIs. And so even though you might not have any symptoms, it's time for that MRI, and you start getting fearful again. Anytime you're waiting for the results of a test, that's very difficult. And often, I'm sure you've noticed that your test is on Friday and you won't get the results till Monday. And that's the longest weekend you've probably ever had to go through. Anytime there's a change in your treatment modality, maybe you had surgery and now it's time to have radiation. So anytime there's a change from one type of treatment to another treatment, that can be uh, fearful. Or when you go from radiation to chemotherapy, even if it's oral chemotherapy, it's something new and different, so that's going to make you more fearful. And also, and I'm sure you can all appreciate this, at the end of treatment, people become more fearful. Often that's when suddenly people come to see me in psychiatry, their treatment's over, and they're so surprised because they're so fearful. They were able to go through all the different treatments that they had to, and now that it's over, now what? So their fears have gone up and they sometimes need help with that. Also the anniversary of a diagnosis. You may not remember many anniversaries in your life. You might not be able to tell me when your oldest child's birthday is or when your wedding anniversary is, but every one of you can tell me the day you were diagnosed with a brain tumor. And even though you might not be consciously aware of it, when that time comes around, you may notice you're a little bit more fearful, and then you realize, oh, yeah, 10 years ago today is when I was diagnosed. When you hear about someone else getting diagnosed with cancer or somebody that you know, maybe you all went through treatment together, and they have more cancer, or especially when you hear about people who died from cancer, different types of cancer. Maybe they're uh, news uh, men are stars that died from cancer and you think, oh no, that reminds you that you could die from cancer. Even though they might not have the kind of cancer that you had, it just reminds you that people do die from cancer. Marilyn Ferguson said, ultimately, we know deeply that the other side of every fear is freedom. So when you're fearful about your workup and you get an MRI and everything is stable, then you feel free, don't you? Yay, I'm free. I'm cancer free right now. Everything is stable. Now, 
people who have depression or anxiety do not choose to have it. It's not a choice. But these are both treatable conditions. But they can't be treated overnight. It does take time to treatment, treat them and patience and understanding. Now, often the family, when, the, when someone has depression, the family says, all you need to do is get up and do something. Well, I'm sure you're thinking, if I could get up, I would get up. Nobody likes feeling that way. Well, one of the important things to do is ask for help. And all the way from 10% of people with cancer to 99%, depending on what study was done and where the cancer site was, people have depression or anxiety or depression and anxiety. They can come together. So what is anxiety? It's excessive, uncontrollable worry. You may find yourself worrying occasionally about certain things, like it's time for my MRI, so I'm a little worried about that. But if you worry every day, if the worry interferes with your life, that's excessive. And for every day for almost six months, you worry about things. You Physically, it may affect you. Psychologically, it affects you. Sometimes I ask the person I'm seeing, is there a day goes by that you don't think about cancer? And people that are anxious know, I think about it every day, all the time. But it must, must affect a lot of uh, your activities or other domains of your life. At least three of these symptoms. Chronic apprehension. You're always afraid that something's going to happen. You're, start, you're afraid for your children. You're afraid for your siblings. You're afraid for your friends. You worry about everything. Some people tell me they came from a family of worriers. And unfortunately, it can be learned behavior. You can't relax. Every time you relax, you may startle. Uh, you think of things that you need to do or things that haven't been done. Some people experience chest pain, shortness of breath. There are people that have gone to the hospital thinking they had a heart attack when what they're having is an anxiety attack. An anxiety attack does make you feel like that. Your heart races, it may be hard for you to breathe, and you think that something horrible is going to happen. You go to the hospital, they do an EKG, they do a workup, and find you're, you're not having a heart attack, so it must be an anxiety attack. Sometimes this can wake you up out of the middle of the night. It's not just because you're thinking about something, it's just your body's way of reacting to stress. Some people obsess. All they obsessing is when you keep thinking about the same thing over and over and over and ruminating. You keep about keep thinking about the same thing. Maybe somebody said something to you and then you didn't say what you wanted to, and you think, oh, I should have said this, and then you keep going over and over the the uh, scenario again and again. It may be very difficult to concentrate. One of the ways you can test your concentration: Are you able to watch a 30-minute TV show? Are you able to watch an hour TV show and stay, you know, keep uh, the, the characters in the show, you know what's going on? Can you watch a movie? People that have difficulty concentrating have a great deal of difficulty watching movies because they lose interest. Uh, people that used to like to read and they would read books and books and books, if they have difficulty concentrating, they can't read books anymore because there's too much information they have to stay focused on. They may be able to read a magazine. As you know, magazines are a lot of pictures and short articles, but not able to concentrate on reading a book. It may be difficult to sleep because the worry is, is keeping you awake. Or when you wake up, you start worrying. Crying may be part of anxiety, but not always. And rituals. When you think about it, there are people who... When you think about your closet, if your closet, maybe you have all your shirts together and all your pants and women have all their dresses together. Um, somebody told me they had theirs by the colors of the rainbow. Other people uh, fold their towels all a certain way and want them a certain way on the shelf. Other people have their spices alphabetized or in their pantry, all the corns together and the peas. Then there are people who, who sweep and clean the floor every day. Uh, there's a lady that I saw that washed her sheets every other day. Some people are checkers. They go and they make sure to check that they turn the stove off or check that they make sure they turn the hair dryer off or that they put the garage door down. These are rituals that people have learned to do 
and that those rituals have helped them control their anxiety. By controlling their environment, they control their anxiety. That's not obsessive compulsive behavior unless it interferes with your life, but it has obsessive compulsive tendencies to it. And what happens when a person's being treated for cancer, often the fatigue interferes with their ability to do those rituals. Or somebody comes in and hangs their clothes in the wrong place, doesn't fold the towels the right way, and that might make them feel more anxious. So all their life they've probably been dealing with anxiety, but they found ways to control it by making lists, by doing these different things. That helped them control their anxiety, and when they can't do those rituals anymore, it increases their anxiety. So how do you treat anxiety? It depends on the cause. Often if you can't breathe well and you're not getting enough oxygen, you're going to feel real anxious and agitated. If you have an infection, you're going to have high fever. That's going to make you agitated. If you have pain, of course, nobody can relax when they're having pain. And there's certain drugs, <clears throat> excuse me, that can uh, have side effects that look like agitation. Drugs people take for nausea like a fenugrin, a compazine, reglan. Those drugs work very well for that, but some people get agitated with the drugs and they just need to get different drugs. So pain medicine, if somebody's having pain, that can help. And when the pain's taken care of, that takes care of the anxiety, right? Because you're not hurting anymore. Anti-anxiety drugs can work very well. Um, most of these drugs are short-acting, like Ativan or Lorazepam. And it works in a, it works for about four hours, and it takes the anxiety away, and then it helps you to focus on other things. Antidepressants are often for depression as well as anxiety. But once again, they don't work for about three weeks. Anti-seizure drugs can be helpful. Also, uh, antipsychotic drugs in very tiny doses can help with anxiety. And the nice thing about those drugs they don't, uh, you don't build up a tolerance and they're not addicting at all. So sometimes people take Seroquel or Zyprexa and small doses that helps them sleep and helps them with their anxiety. And of course, if somebody's having shortness of breath, oxygen can help. And once they get enough oxygen, they're not going to feel anxious anymore. Antihistamines, if somebody's allergic to medication, that's going to help. And I talked about antipsychotics. Supportive psychotherapy can be very helpful. But sometimes people are so anxious, they need medication so that they can participate in therapy. Cognitive behavioral techniques can help. For instance, people that are anxious have a great deal of difficulty being in the present. They're very focused on what if. What if the treatment doesn't work? Or what if the cancer comes back? So rather than focusing on the unknown, you focus on the present. So right now, if you're in treatment, the only thing that you know is, right now I know my cancer is being treated. That's all that you know, and that's all that your doctor knows. If you're through with treatment and your disease is stable, right now you know my disease is stable. Or if you know you don't have cancer anymore, I don't have cancer. That's what you know right now. By going to the unknown, what about if my cancer comes back? Then you're living like you have cancer today. So rather than live that way when you have a free time, when you don't have active disease, focus on what you have right now. I don't have cancer now. I don't have active disease. Or I'm taking therapy now. It's treating my cancer. Yeah, but what if it doesn't work? Nope, that's not what you know, is it? You focus on what you know. Right now, you know, my cancer is being treated. Occupational therapy can also help, especially if you have some deficits in being able to uh, bathe yourself or drive or doing uh, activities of daily living. Occupational therapy can help, and then that can take away the anxiety because you can take care of yourself. Recreational therapy can also help because it provides distraction. Often people... Uh, like helping other people. If they can volunteer for short periods of time, that helps them because they help other people. 
So what is coping? We talk about coping, right? Coping depends on what type of cancer you have, what stage your cancer is, what treatments you're getting. Sometimes the type of cancer you have can be treated by surgery, and that's all. Sometimes you need several different types of treatment. Depends on what symptoms you have. If your symptom of your brain tumor was a seizure, and you had surgery, and that's gone, you're not having seizures anymore, then that's not interfering with your life. Sometimes your symptoms may leave you with uh, mobility issues, and so that's going to make it a, a bit difficult to cope. And how the course of your disease went, that also depends on, uh, affects your coping. And the prognosis. The prognosis is what's the prediction for how your cancer is going to do. Coping also has to do with your prior level of adjustment. What happened in your past and how did you adjust to it? Like I was saying a while ago, those of you who are through with treatment and you look back on the past and you never ever thought you'd be able to go through what you've gone through and you adjusted and you went through it. Also has to do with your personality. There's some people whose personality is very easygoing and they kind of just roll with the punches. Other people are much more agitated and everything seems to be a drama. Well, that's how they cope. What their coping style is. For some people, they don't have a very ho healthy coping style. What they do, maybe they smoke more or they drink more or they use illicit drugs. That's a very unhealthy coping style. Other people's coping style, that may include prayer. They may use meditation. Uh, another coping style can be to help other people. And your prior experience with loss can also help you with coping. It doesn't mean that you ever get used to dealing with loss, but as you know, living with cancer and having a cancer diagnosis is a lot of loss. And depending on what kind of side effects and how your cancer presents itself, there's things that you lose in life and then how, how do you live with the new normal? Also, your disease may be a threat to attaining education. Often I see people who are in college, and maybe they were late, you know, in their 40s and went back to school, and now they got cancer, and so they had to drop out of school. Other people may have been uh, planning to get married, but they, because they have cancer, they're not going to get married because they don't want to bring that burden to their loved one. While other people get married when they have cancer because the person really wants to marry them and support them. For some people, they're not in a relationship and they're afraid how, that this is going to affect their dating. For some people, they delayed pregnancy and the woman wants to get pregnant but she's afraid because she has cancer. So it's very important to find out how pregnancy fits in with their diagnosis. Sometimes they're young parents and they're dealing with young children. And this, this is interfering with their ability to raise their children because somebody has to help them. If somebody has teenagers, that's, that in itself is very difficult without having cancer on top of it. So it, all of this is going to interfere with the child rearing. Sometimes people are just started their career and now they have cancer and they have to drop out because they have to get cancer treatment. So it's going to interfere with their career. I've seen people who thought they were going to retire early, but now they have cancer. They decided that they need to work as long as possible so they can have insurance. Um, and then often uh, people think, well, you know, when I retire, I'm going to travel. Well, when they have cancer, they have to stay close to where they're getting treatment because uh, to deal with the side effects. So that's going to uh, interfere with their ability to travel. Coping also has to do with attitudes. And your attitudes come from your culture, the culture you grew up in, what spiritual attitudes you have, and what religious attitudes. Spiritual, spirituality is, your, is, a, is a vertical connection to a higher being. Your religion is a horizontal connect, uh, connection to other people with like religious views. Uh, it also has to do with emotionally supportive persons. 
if there are people in your life who are emotionally supportive. You know, sometimes people tell me that their husband will bring them to their appointments, but their husband's not emotionally supportive. They just are physically there, but emotionally they're not supportive for them. Often there are other people who are emotionally supportive for them. Also, depending on what side effects you have and how the disease or the treatment affected you, if there's potential for rehabilitation, then you know you can get better if you go through rehabilitation. That gives you hope, that there, there's hope for the future. So there's tasks involved with coping. The very first task is you have to believe that you have a brain tumor. You have to integrate the diagnosis. Once It's very hard to believe because you might have been feeling well. Often people with brain tumors tell me they weren't so surprised because they had symptoms, they might have had headaches, or weakness, or uh, seizures. So they weren't so surprised, but it just is kind of overwhelming to think they have a brain tumor. So they have to integrate that diagnosis and believe they have it. Once they do that, then that helps them deal with whatever plan, whatever treatment plan there is. They have to be able to tolerate stress. And I'm sure most of you are shaking your head yes. It's extremely stressful to go through a cancer treatment, just to go through every appointment, just to understand what the doctor's saying and understand uh, what, what's next after you've had this treatment, then what's next. Tolerate the stress of getting to the doctor, of the blood work, of the, all the different tests you have, and then to adjust to the healthcare system. You have to learn a whole new language. I'm sure most of you had no idea nor any any uh, desire to learn the words that you've learned about the glioblastoma multiforme, our astrocytoma, our all those different cytomas that you had that you can have. You never thought about learning what those meant, about different medications that you're taking and what they're for, and what your blood counts mean then you have to be able to make treatment decisions, very difficult treatment decisions that only you can make. Your family is supportive of whatever decision you make because you are the one that has to go through the treatment. You are the one that has to go through the side effects of the treatment. Often people tell me, I really didn't want to go through treatment, but I don't want to let my family down. I'm doing this for my family. And then I'll ask them, well, does your family know that? No, no, I don't want to tell them. I'm just doing this for my family. If it was up to me, I would stop treatment. So I encourage them to talk to their family to make sure that they're all on the same page. Also, and this is very difficult, to communicate what your diagnosis is and what it means to other people. Especially with a brain tumor, there may, you may be in treatment for many years. And it's hard for people to understand, well, you know, I had a friend with breast cancer and she was treated for a year. And now she's not getting treatment anymore. That's a different kind of cancer. So people think, you know, they're talking apples and oranges instead of this is a brain tumor, depending on where it is, what type it is. Uh, it's very difficult to tell people. I always ask a person, who was the hardest person you had to tell about your cancer? And for parents, it might have been their children. Uh, so for some people, it was the, if they have older parents, it was telling their older parents. Then there's people I know who would not tell their older parents they had a brain tumor because they're afraid that would make them die. And I reminded them, you know, your mother's 86 years old. She survived for 86 years. And I'm sure she didn't have an easy life all these 86 years. So she will be able to tolerate that. You're her daughter. It's important for her to be able to know and to be able to help you in any way she can. And, you know, people want to do things. What it, what They want to do things for you, but they don't know what to do. Sometimes it's just really simple things like, can you go to the grocery store for me? And here's my list and, you know, here's some money. It's simple things like that, but people want to do things and they don't know what that is. Sometimes it's taking you to your treatment and driving you there so that your family member can go to work. 
so it's simple things and people want to help. But I know it's very difficult to ask for help. Dennis Waitley says time is an equal opportunity employer. Each individual has exactly the same number of hours and minutes every day. Think about it. We have 60 minutes and an hour. Rich people can't buy any more hours. Scientists can't invent new minutes. And you can't save time to spend it on another day. Even so, time is amazingly fair and forgiving. No matter how much time you've wasted in the past, you still have tomorrow. So you don't want to waste your time worrying about what if it comes back when today you're either getting treatment or you're through with treatment because this is the only time that you have. Build your support team, your caregivers, family, friends, support groups. Uh, the, the American Brain Tumor Association offers a lot of different webinars. Physicians and your healthcare team, spiritual support, psychosocial clinicians. Think about who your support team is. Some of you may have one person, but that's still part of your support team. And when you start thinking about it, you may have more people than you think on your team. Why do you even need a team? Well, it makes you feel more secure. You don't feel as isolated. And you're also not as vulnerable to depression when there are people you know that care about you and want you to get better. When you take someone to your appointments with you, you get better information processing and management because they may hear what you don't hear and you may hear something that they didn't hear. Being able to take you to and from your treatment, that's physical and logistical support. And it increases your likelihood of successful coping if you have a support team. Resources, the American Brain Tumor Association mentoring program. Can Care is another uh, support program. Cancer Counseling, Inc., MD Anderson Network, the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, made up of psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and nurses that help people with cancer, medical social workers, mental health professionals, brain tumor support groups. In your local institution, you may have brain tumor support groups. I would advise you to go to them. They can be very helpful. Private counseling can be helpful. Uh, back to the support groups. There are some people that really, really go to support groups and it really helps them. Other people, when they go to support groups, they get real depressed because they take on the pain of the other members. If that's the case, maybe a support group is not best for you. Other people feel like if I can go to a support group, it helps other people. And those are people that need to be in support groups because they do help each other. Religious organizations can all, are is also a resource. Control what you can. You know, there's a lot of things in life we don't have control over. In fact, a lot of things. But you can control what you eat. You can control how much you exercise. You can control drinking and smoking. You can stop that. You can control what you do for fun. You know, if you've been doing something for a long time and you used to enjoy it, you don't enjoy it anymore, then don't do it anymore. You think, what am I doing this for? Just because I've done every Monday I've gone to yoga doesn't mean... I don't enjoy it. I feel like I'm not getting anything out of it. Then find something else to do. Weight management. This is very difficult. But do what you can and get help from a dietitian. Adherence to treatment. Do what they tell you to do. Then you know you've done everything you can to keep your disease under control. And control your stress. Find what relieves your stress. Eleanor Roosevelt in 1960, and you know she'd been through a lot, said you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you stop to look fear in the face. You're able to say to yourself, I've lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. So it's important that you've lived through this, and whatever comes along, you'll deal with it when it comes along. Because there's no way you can anticipate what's going to happen, right? You could have never predicted that you were going to get a brain tumor and all the treatment you would have to go through to get through it. But you did. You went through it. And whatever comes along next, you can get through it. I would like to thank all of you, and hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully you have some questions for me. 
Thank you, Ms. Hughes, for that wonderful presentation. Um, Ms. Hughes will now take questions. So if you have a question you would like to ask, please type and submit it using the question box in the webinar control panel on the right hand of your screen. Uh, Mary, we have one question here. It is, what happens if the depression goes undiagnosed or untreated post-treatment for an extended period of time? Well, it won't go away, and often it gets worse. And, you know, depression is curable. That's our goal when we treat people for depression. Our goal is to cure them of depression. It's not just take care of it for a little while. And what we tell people is when we give the medication, that you will, once the medication starts working and your depression is gone, you'll need to be on the medicine for at least six months to make sure it's gone. And then at the end of six months, we'll look at getting you off of the medication. But what I found is often people tell me, once they're not depressed on medication, they've been depressed all their life and didn't realize it until they finally weren't depressed. So for some people, they need antidepressants forever. It's sort of like if you're diabetic, you're going to need insulin forever. It's just part of what you need to be able to function in a healthy way. Thank you for that. Another question we have is, can you talk about the role of hormones on depression and tumor growth? Well, that's a good question because there's different kinds of hormones. There's female hormones, estrogen, male hormones, testosterone, and then there's steroids. Those are considered hormones too. Often, in fact, always people that I see that have radiation because of brain tumors, if they have radiation to their head, they're going to get steroids, which decreases the swelling in the brain. Often people that take chemotherapy will get steroids because it decreases the side effects of the chemotherapy. Sometimes people get different types of uh, steroids, to, like megase, to increase their appetite. Um, it depends, you know, if you're talking about a breast uh, tumor, if it's estrogen receptive, then hormones, estrogen will make the tumor grow. But for brain tumors, I'm not familiar with any connection between estrogen and testosterone and brain tumors. Thank you. Um, another question we have here is a, for those who, you had touched upon this a little bit in your presentation, but for those who have libido issues as well as a total lack of patience with their spouse or in the relationship that they're in, what are some suggestions that you have for them of what to do next? Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and that happens to be one of my subspecialties, sexuality and cancer. So for women that have low libido, uh, it may be because they were thrown in early menopause. Men with low libido, it's very important to get their testosterone level checked. Even if it's low normal, the doctor the, then you get sent to an endocrinologist. The doctor may want to supplement your testosterone with a patch or with gel. And studies have shown that men who take testosterone do not have an increased risk for getting prostate cancer. So testosterone, women even have testosterone, and it's what mediates uh, desire, sexual desire. Uh, not only with desire, but if women are in menopause, they may have vaginal dryness. Uh, men may have, depending on you know how the treatment affects them, may, they may have erectile dysfunction. Um, and so they may need to check with the doctor. If they're not on nitrates, they can take any of the PDE5 inhibitors like Cialis or Viagra or Levitra. Uh, so they may need uh, help with other, with other things to help them sexually. But the first step is to talk about it with your partner. And often if the brain tumor is in the frontal lobe, it may, it may cause personality changes and they may be angry, not just angry with their partner, but angry at themselves because they can't perform like they used to. Thank you. Another question we have here is, do you find that brain cancer affects people's anxiety and depression in a different way than other cancers, as it has a direct impact to the brain? Not necessarily, but depending on where the, the uh, tumor is, if it's in the frontal, the frontal lobe is your personality. And so sometimes that can be the first 
sign of a brain tumor is that the personality's changed. So for some people, because they had frontal lobe tumor, it uh, changed their personality. So not necessarily a change their anxiety. It may, may make them more anxious or may make them depressed. It's not necessarily a different. They do respond to medication, like someone without a brain tumor that has depression and anxiety, but that may be the first time they ever get it because of where the tumor was. Great, thank you. And for those who are currently under the care for anxiety and depression, um, one worry is that sometimes the doctors diminish the depression symptoms because they had those before they had the brain tumor. Do you think there are, do you have any best practices for presenting your depression related issues to your physician related to the brain tumor? Well, uh, for us in psychiatry here at MD Anderson, if someone had depression before they had a brain tumor, they're highly likely to have more depression after the brain tumor. So it, it needs to be treated regardless of, of if they ever had brain tumor or not. Depression needs to be treated. And so so you had it before. Well, now there's even more reason to treat it so you can get rid of, I don't have to deal with depression, get rid of the depression while you're focusing on dealing with the brain tumor. You can ask for a psychiatric uh, referral. Uh, hopefully in the institution that you're in or the doctor has a psychiatrist that they refer to, and you can go see the psychiatrist and they can get your your depression treated. Because psychiatry, we're experts at treating depression and anxiety. We would never give you any cancer medicine, but often all different kinds of doctors feel free to treat depression when that's not their, that's not their field of expertise. Thank you for that. Also, are there any holistic remedies for treating depression? There's, uh, and that's, a, that's a also a good question because I've been asked to speak at the Integrative Medicine uh, Conference several times, and uh, I've looked up all the different uh, holistic treatments for depression, and none are evidence-based. They, you know, they, they will give uh, the, the herb and give a placebo, and people didn't do any better on one than they did the other. So as of right now, there's not any evidence-based uh, holistic treatment for depression. And another question was asking about if you know what are some of the best drugs to treat depressive and negative symptoms. Um, no, I, I can name all the drugs and some drugs work very well. I know that if you've had a brain tumor, they will likely not give you a drug called Wellbutrin or Bupropion because it can lower your risk of seizures, lower the seizure threshold. So that's one drug, and it's, a, it's in a family all by itself, and so you will not be given that drug. The drugs that are specific serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro, Celexa, we use those a lot. Uh, the SNRIs, like Effexor and Cymbalta and Pristique, those drugs, can, especially Cymbalta, can help with neuropathic pain. If you have that as a side effect from uh, your treatment, you may be given Cymbalta, uh, but Effexor can work, uh, and, and uh, Pristique. Those are in that family. There's some old, old drugs like uh, Trazodone and um, Nortriptyline, Amitriptyline. Those uh, in low doses can be used for sleep, and you don't build up any tolerance to that. Uh, at high doses, they treat depression, but they can cause uh, low blood pressure. They can cause really bad dry mouth. So uh, low doses, sometimes doctors will give, like especially trazodone, for sleep. Thank you. And I think we just have time for one more question. Um, this one is, if someone has sought help in this area with both a neuropsychologist and psychologist, but they're always looking for tips on how to handle stress at work from managers who really do not understand some of the problems created by brain tumors. If you have any tips on how to handle these types of stresses? Well, I do know that um, if you have mobility problems, that all workplaces are obligated to provide you with whatever special devices you need to work, like if you need a, a wheelchair or if you whatever whatever devices you need, 
um, and you may talk to your your uh, manager that these things that you're dealing with are permanent. They're they're long term, and they won't go away just because your brain tumor's gone away. You're left with some residual side effects. And uh, if you know what you need, if you need more time to work on a project, uh, if you need to be able to work less hours and, and go home and you could work at home, uh, depending on what you need, you can ask them for what you need. And you can also go to HR and ask them, um, you know, certain, certain jobs have certain, certain uh, criteria that you have to be able to, like you need to be able to lift 10 pounds or whatever it is. There's some criteria, and if you can't do that, then that that's the job description. So it is very difficult when you're talking with a manager that doesn't understand. What I found is when managers have somebody in their family with cancer, they're much more understanding. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Hughes. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all for joining us, and thanks once again to Ms. Hughes for her wonderful webinar presentation. For more information, oh, go ahead. Well, if there are more questions, if you know, you can always email them to me through the uh, Brain Tumor Association. Great, thank you so much. And also for more information on brain tumors to help patients and caregivers process the diagnosis, understand a new and difficult vocabulary, and access resources to help make informed decisions, you can also call the ABTA Care Line at 800 886-2282. Let's pause for just a moment to conclude our webinar recording.